So please make sure you understand these rules. Um, am I being heard? I can never tell these things. All right. Are we good? Welcome to A Tour Through the Notebooks, part 1.2, because we thought it would be three parts, probably going to be five or six. So, do with that information what you will. Um, let us begin. Today we're going to go over game day. And so the most important thing to know about game day is the agenda for game day. And what that entails is it is a sheet of paper that our team leaders will receive upon game day. Uh, before anything happens, really, for uh, opening ceremonies, for uh, we meet up, the first time we get there, we get a sheet that will tell us everything we need to know. It'll tell us what teams we're being paired with, because we need to know who our alliances are going to be. It'll tell us what side our alliance is on, because, well, we don't want to be on the wrong side, and, well, it's self-explanatory. And what team we'll be competing against, which also, self-explanatory. We, we need to know this stuff. So, first step to any meeting is a qualification match. Now, the thing about qualification matches is they're scored kind of strangely, and we'll get to that later. But the more important thing is that we will be competing in teams of two alliances. And as you play qualification matches, your team will be placed on a scoreboard and compared with other teams in the tournament. And, well, people with the highest score are the best, and we'll move on to the elimination rounds which we'll talk about later. And the calculation for who gets on the scoreboard will be explained later. Now I explain the calculation. <laughs> so, there is a very clear ranking. It goes, the most important thing to have is total ranking points. Now what total ranking points means is it means the actual score your team ended with. Here, this team ended with 111 total ranking points. This team ended with 41 total ranking points. Let's assume they were the only two alliances to show up to the uh, meet and they only had one round. Well, these guys would move on to finals and then these guys would also move on to finals because that's how elimination works. But the second thing to keep in mind is total tiebreaker points. Now there are two types of tiebreaker points. There's TDP1 and TDP2. TDP1 is the number of points you score in the autonomous period. Whereas TDP2 is the number of points you've scored at the end of the game. So that would be the combination of driver control period points as well as end game points. And it's important to keep in mind, based off of these two, you can tell that the autonomous, while technically being worth the same number of points, is actually more important than your driver controlled and end game periods because they will be a greater determinant in whether you move on to finals or not. And if all else fails and everyone scores perfectly even and something goes wrong, then there's a random electronic selection, which also pretty much never happens, but just be aware that that could happen. Scouting. Uh, this is an important one for all you kids to know. It's important for both offense and relational building. So first part, scouting when you're trying to figure out who you want to be paired up with. So let's say you have a really great team and you have a good chance of getting on to the elimination round. Well, then you're going to have to choose your alliance. And if you choose your alliance, you want to choose the people who are best suited for your team. If that's the case, then you want to understand what other teams are capable of. It's all about creating good synergies with other teams. If you can create those good synergies, you'll be more likely to win the game because you can get higher combinations of points. Uh, it's also a good time to learn about outreach. A lot of us wonder about what to do now because of COVID with outreach. Well a lot of teams like to showcase the amount of outreach they've done so that other judges can see. We can use this for inspiration to create better outreach programs for ourselves and in turn bolster our own score at subsequent meets. There's two methods of scouting, passive and active. So the first method is passive, and that's typically done during the actual competition. Usually you'll have one or two individuals sitting in the stands uh, watching what's going on and taking note of the capabilities and the uh, limitations of certain robots so you, can be, so you can better understand what the robots are able to do in competition. Active is when you go up to a team after or before a round and actually talk to them and find out what they think their robot is capable of. This is important because a lot of the times 
what um, you're not able to see everything a robot is capable of due to the constraints of normal match play. So it's important to ask yourself, how will your team perform the scouting? Every team can do it differently, and there are different methods of doing it. Sometimes you want to have multiple scouts, sometimes you just want one, and sometimes you just want to have different types of scouts. And you need to decide that amongst your team before you go out and start competing. Alliance of se selection. So this is basically where everything comes down to it. Let's say hypothetically you weren't one of the top four teams. You don't get to choose who is in your alliance. Or, and you don't get to move on to finals unless you're chosen by another team. So this is where your qualification match performance really pays off. If you have a high score, you're more likely to be chosen. And if you showcase your robot to be capable of things, even if you weren't able to achieve such a high score, then that'll also pay off because teams will take that into account. Um, you want to be chosen as an alliance partner, as I said, and that's where gracious professionalism comes in. No one's going to take a good team if they're jerks, so it's important to make sure you're nice and also have a good robot because that matters too. Now, alliances and seeds. So this is a bracket of what finals and semifinals looks like. Seeding is basically a system that we use to determine who's going to go into finals and semifinals. So let's say you have four teams that were all placed in the top four. First team would get first pick, second team would choose second person, until every team has chosen one other team uh, from the general roundup, and after that, the entire uh, it would for first team would get to choose another pick. In the end, you have three teams on uh, three teams on each alliance, so that each and then each team has to play a certain number of rounds within each round. I mean, play a certain number of games within each round in order to qualify to move on to the next one. However, if let's say hypothetically team one, the number one team in the league, decides to choose team two to be on their alliance, in that case. Team two could accept, in which case team three would move up to second position, team four up to uh, third, and so on and so forth. Now this can happen for pretty much the, as many times as, well, I mean, team, well, it can happen a certain number of times to a certain extent. Um, and it's important that you make sure you understand these rules because you need to understand strategy, not just for the game, but how you're going to approach the game. And so, here it is. So the seeds, typically, well, always, first seed will be paired up against the lowest ranking seed, and second ranking seed will be paired up against the third ranking seed. The winner will move on to semi, will move on to finals, and obviously the winner of that will move on to finals. However, that's not the only way to succeed in first robotics. As you can see, here are the advancement criteria, and it actually goes down to about 52, but I'm not going to bore you with that because that seems boring. And it starts with the most important award, which is actually the Inspire Award. It's not uh, ranking first overall. They care more about your engineering notebook than they do act about your actual robot performance, which is an important thing to take in mind. And in the situation that the Inspire Award is also the winning alliance captain, then it would actually be moved up, and a certain number of people can be chosen. And I believe depending on the uh, region that it's in, a different number of people are chosen. I think for Colorado, we typically have three. Is that correct? Yeah, I think it's three or three. I, yeah, right around three. And so, as you can see, there's a lot of move up and down things. You know what I'm saying. Um, another thing, hooting, hollering, and other points of etiquette. So team cheers, chants, banners, flags, and uh, any other memorabilia you might have. Go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. So, team cheers, chants, banners, flags, and any other memorabilia you might have are allowed and encouraged by First Robotics. They encourage a healthy amount of team spirit. However, it's important to keep in mind, you need to remain graciously professional. I'm the important first. Arguably the most important, well, that's the well, important game. It's the most important part about First Robotics. Uh, taunting, jeering, any sort of negativity, oh, Overly verbose negativity is not allowed and seen as a sign of poor sportsmanship and could result in a yellow or even red card. And as Sean mentioned, red and yellow cards can carry over to the next round, meaning that, well, you're basically doomed to lose that round. 
Um, using banners and flags is prohibited if you're trying to save spots. So it's important to remember, even despite COVID, there are a limited number of seats that people can take. And if we want to have people take these seats, well, you can't let people save their seats so that other people can use the seats. It gets repetitive after a while. Just be polite is the main point I'm trying to get at. Uh, just don't be rude. And if you have to ask yourself if this thing is prob if this thing is allowed, it's probably not allowed. If you really feel like you need to do it, talk with your team leader. But chances are it's not allowed, so just don't do it, I guess. That's what it comes down to. And that is it. Does anyone have any questions? Can I make a couple clarifying statements? Sure, thank a lot of them. Uh, at this point, we do not know if there are going to be qualifiers this year or not. We do not know if the competition is going to be in person or if it is going to be digitally run. So depending on how things work this year, this is, this is very good information to have going towards a competition how far we get into those competitions, um, they have not, Colorado first has not figured out yet. First has not figured out yet. So we just need to be aware, um, things may drastically change in, in our strategy if we end up being 100% remote when it comes to these competitions. There's a lots of different ways they can do it. You can have the judges uh, over a camera uh, watching you compete. Um, one of the things they actually said is possible, we could score our own events and we would send in our six best scores is one possibility for the way that this can happen. So uh, we just have to wait and see how things turn out. And further information on all the differences between the uh, in-person and digital events will actually be showcased in part three, which will probably be closer to part five or six, depending on how this goes. But we'll go over every specific, not every specific detail, but most of the specific details that people will need to know moving forward. 